So I'm going to continue the talk on rheumatologic ophthalmologic diseases, and this one is probably much more common than the one that um, Tom was talking about. Um, so I'm going to talk about temporal arteritis. Um, and in recent times, uh, the residents have been getting quite a few calls from either the primary service or the ER regarding whether or not their patient <coughs> has temporal arteritis. And I've discovered that sometimes this patient may or may not even have any ophthalmologic symptoms or neurologic symptoms. So at first, I was kind of annoyed. <laughs> um, but in preparing for this talk, um, I've confirmed that temporal arteritis is a disease that's, um, in at least in the literature, is shared between rheumatology and ophthalmology. Um, and so my job today is to equip you with some uh, information about temporal arteritis and hopefully um, to make sure that you're not annoyed <laughs> when you get called about patients, um, possibly with temporal arteritis, who don't necessarily have eye symptoms. So um, we'll talk, we'll review the basics of temporal arteritis or giant cell arteritis, um, review some ophthalmologic presentations of giant cell arteritis, and then finally, um, give you some updates on the antibiotic treatment study. In terms of the history of temporal arteritis, it is a relatively new disease, um, described mostly in the last 100 years. Um, and the only hint of some description of this disease in ancient times is um, this picture on the tomb of an Egyptian pharaoh who, um, and he has a picture of, well the tomb has a picture of a harpist who looks really sick um, and may have some <laughs> thickening of his temporal artery and may be blind as well um, because of his kind of looking into space um, glance compared to the other people. And so that's kind of a stretch, um, but it does reflect the fact that this is possibly a newer disease. Um, it was first described a little over 100 years ago by Hutchinson. He described a man that has such painful scalp that he couldn't put his hat on. And then 50 years later, um, Horton described um, two cases of patients with giant cell arteritis sy systemic sy symptoms. And um, he described it in a weekly Mayo Clinic conference and then later described five more people. And interestingly, none of them had eye vision symptoms. Um, so he and his colleagues, well, there's multiple names that have been proposed and probably the only one that's stuck is giant cell arteritis. Um, but he and his colleagues ended up trying to find out if there's an infectious cause. Um, they ground up bits of positive um, biopsies and um, in injected it into five healthy controls um, that were aged, matched. And none of these controls ended up getting the disease. Um, and then the last patient that they injected it into, it wasn't in the scalp, so the other five were into the scalp. Um, the last patient, they injected it into her vein, and she did develop symptoms of fevers, malaise, elevated ESR, um, but because the other five didn't develop the symptoms, <coughs> they concluded that it wasn't an infectious process, but rather um, some type of autoimmune process. Um, by definition, temporal arteritis is an immune-mediated vasculitis of the medium and the large uh, vessels, and the vessels that are most vulnerable are the ones, um, or the vessels of the cranial bed, um, and these include the superficial temporal artery, the vertebral artery, which is not depicted here, um, the ophthalmic artery, and um, the posterior ciliary artery. And in autopsy studies, um, so just to get yourself acquainted with this picture, um, and the, I guess the black vessels here are the ones that are most commonly affected in giant cell arteritis, and the gray ones are medium affected, and then the white ones are the least affected in giant cell arteritis. Um, and so as I said before, th the more common vessels affected um, include the superficial temporal, the vertebral, the ophthalmic artery, and the posterior ciliary artery. Um, and you'll find that this high incidence of occurrence in the vessel actually stops abruptly after it hits the dura. Um, and the same thing happens with the central retinal artery. Um, there's a medium amount of vulnerability, and then once it hits the dural sheath, it loses some of its vulnerability to this vasculitis. And so the question is, um, why does this occur? And it has to do with 
um, histology. So we can kind of look at um, the artery and um, see that there's different layers to the artery. There's the intima, the media, and the adventitia. Um, and arteries actually contain elastin. Um, there's, I think, elastin in all three layers. And so in the vertebral artery, before it hits the dura, it actually is thicker and it has a lot more elastin. So a lot more elastin in the tunica media and the tunica adventitia. And here, the elastin is darker staining. And then once you hit the dura, there's a lot less elastin. And so the amount of elastin actually correlates with how vulnerable the vessel is to vasculitis. And when you talk about temporal arteritis, um, we have to know that age matters. Um, and there's a, age, a peak prevalence between 70 and 80. Um, it is much more common in northern Euro Europe. It's been de well described in Scandinavian countries. And when you look at Europe, when you go from north to south, there's a decline in incidence. There's also a higher prevalence in women, so the ratio is three to one. And in population studies, and so this is a population study from Olmsted County, Minnesota, um, they not only found that the rate of giant cell arteritis is increasing over time, they also found this kind of cyclical pattern to things. And this average is out to be every five years. And because of this cyclical pattern, they have proposed that there could be some environmental trigger that is going on. And they have tried to match it with flus that have kind of a cyclical pattern. So there's a lot of viruses like parainfluenza para virus, EBV, um, chlamydia, other things that have been uh, proposed to be um, a trigger for these cycles. Um, so I just want to take a jab at the pathogenesis. Um, and so thinking is that there's some type of virus or antigen that is triggering inflammation of the arterial walls. And the first thing that happens is that there's activation of dendrocytes. And then the dendrocytes, once they're involved, they spit out chemokines. And then the chemokines in some way actually causes fragmentation of the elastic lamina. So brings us back to this elastin issue. And then once this fragmentation starts, this casca cascade starts with hyperplasia and then ultimately um, occlusion of the vessel. And when you occlude the vessel, you get symptoms. And so when you're taking a history, the most common symptoms in giant cell arteritis by far are a new headache and jaw claudication. And the new headache can be this temporal artery temporal pain, but the headache can be elsewhere in other places as well. And the jaw pain isn't just pain in the jaw, it's pain when you're chewing. Um, and then also PMR symptoms are basically um, kind of arthritic symptoms in the proximal joints. And I was surprised to find that um, there are a couple symptoms that are super high yield in diagnosing temporal arteritis. So common uh, symptoms that are that have higher likelihood ratios of suspected temporal arteritis was diplopia um, and jaw claudication. That's come up multiple times in the literature, that if there's good clinical correlation, if there's double vision or jaw claudication, that really helps you out. In terms of signs and exam findings, everything revolves around the temporal artery. So there's high likelihood ratios if there's, they've got a beaded temporal artery, they have a prominent or enlarged temporal artery, they've got a ten tender temporal artery, or they have an absent temporal artery pulse. I don't think I've ever palpated somebody's pulse. Um, and then, of course, the, one of the signs that's very helpful is an elevated ESR above 50. And the upper limit of normal for ESR usually is defined at 50 millimeters per hour, but um, to be more accurate, for men it's actually the age divided by 2, and for women it's age plus 10 divided by 2. And unfortunately, um, the ESR isn't always helpful, and approximately 5 to 10 percent of the time you may have biopsy-proven temporal arteritis, but actually have a negative ESR. And so then you have to kind of, you know, use your history-taking skills, and um, there's other markers that can be helpful, including a CRP, which 
is more sensitive. Um, and IL-6 is technically the most sensitive, um, but it's not commercially available and probably not uh, as specific as the other two. Um, in addition, you can have temporal arteritis without an elevate, elevated ESR based on the American College, the American College of Rheumatology criteria. So this was made in 1990. And all you need is three of these. So any three of this, you could potentially have three not with elevated ESR and still have a yield of sensitivity of 93.5 and a specificity of 91.2. So I talked about diplopia being a very important question um, when somebody has good reason to have temporal arteritis. Um, in terms of vision loss, by far, um, the most common etiology is anterior ischemic neuropathy. So in this study of 63 or 64 eyes, by far people had swelling of their optic nerve indicative of an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. And not only is, does this anterior ischemic optic neuropathy have swelling of the nerve, I tried to find one that showed pallor of the nerve. So there's a pallid swelling to it, not just plain swelling. And about 50% of them will have, of people with temporal arteritis with anterior ischemic optic neuropathy will have this milky, chalky, white appearance to the nerve. Um, so treatment of this disease, as you all know, includes steroids and up front, um, it is IV, IV or high dose PO steroids. And this is a long term uh, uh, treatment. So you start at one meg per keg per day for at least a month, and then as long as the patient is stable, they're tapered slowly over a course to of set six to 12 months. And I think this range is even wider, um, meaning that a lot of rheumatologists drag this out a lot longer. The prognosis from a vision standpoint, um, lots of numbers or big range, but the prognosis is between five to 34% can have recovery of vision, and this is recovery of two lines on the Snellen chart. However, if you start out at NLP, your recovery is probably pretty minimal. Um, so now I, I want to present um, some things that uh, I think Dr. Katz had presented on earlier um, this year, um, and what had been presented at Manos. Um, so the data that was presented um, previously was that there is a, been a strong association between giant cell arteritis and a strain of bacteria called Burkholderia. Um, and so previously it's been described that um, the, the Burkholderia DNA has been found in the uh, walls of patients with giant cell arteritis compared to controls who don't have the DNA in their walls. Um, and so we've also found that in ELISA 4, um, this bacteria is found in uh, patients with temporal arteritis and not in patients with controls. Um, and then this is another graph that depicts patients with giant cell arteritis and their ELISA titer for the strain of Burkholderia. Um, and you can tell from here that they have a much higher level than controls. And I think Dr. Kennig actually tested his blood and his value was about 50 picograms per milliliter just, milliliter, just to give you a reference. So although I don't have time to go into some of the basic science research, um, we have been able to isolate um, the organism um, in vitro and show that it can activate um, giant cells and then call upon, um, activate giant cells by activating dendritic cells. Um, and then Dr. Di Domenico, who's a hematologist and did um, a lot of this research um, was able to induce a vasculitis in mice with this bacteria. Um, and then she treated them with steroids and antibiotics. Um, and treating them with both steroid and, and antibiotics seemed to do, um, help the mice do better um, than having them just be treated with steroids or alone, al alone or without anything. So I wanna describe a pilot study. And the purpose of the pilot study um, was number one, to find out if um, treating patients uh, with antibiotics was safe and to use this information to build upon um, a later, larger study. So the inclusion criteria for the pilot study on human subjects was that they had to have a positive biopsy um, for giant cell arteritis. 
um, and they were enrolled either through the rheumatology or neuro-ophthalmology clinics, um, and they had to have a positive Burkholderia ELISA titer. And if they met the inclusion criteria, they were placed on minocycline or doxycycline for 30 days and then put on a steroid taper. It was either an individualized taper, taper or a six-month long taper. And then they were followed for whether or not they had relapsed and if they had any side effects from antibiotics. And then their inflammatory markers were followed as well as their um, Burkholderia lipopolysaccharide titer. So in all, we've enrolled six patients. I'll describe five of them because one of them is still getting treated. Um, so, so in total, there's been three males and three females, and their average age is 80, and they've all had a biopsy that confirms uh, giant cell arteritis. Um, the first case was an 84-year-old man uh, with a new diagnosis of giant cell arteritis. His presentation was central retinal artery occlusion um, with light perception, vision only, alongside headache and jaw pain. And just take note that his initial titer was 538, which is high. So because of that, he was enrolled in the study and placed on an antibiotic for 30 days. And he's been followed for 16 months, and in that time he's had uh, no relapse, and he's been tapered off his steroids completely after a total of 10 months. Um, but he did have one side effect from steroids, and that's avascular necro necrosis. Um, and that he's been asymptomatic, but this was found on um, bone studies. And so this is a graph that depicts his ESR levels in red and his Burkholderia lipopolysaccharide titer in green. Um, and so, and then this gray bar represents his treatment, uh, the time frame that he was treated with minocycline. Um, and you can see that both the titer of the bacteria and the ESR um, drops in conjunction with his remission status and after treatment with antibiotics. Um, case two is an 88-year-old woman. She um, presents previous to, re previous to enrollment with a left frontal stroke and scalp tenderness. Um, she actually had some question of whether or not she had giant cell arteritis um, in her past, but her presentation prior to enrollment was basically a stroke and scalp tenderness and she had elevated ESR and a positive biopsy. And again, her titer was elevated at 521 picograms per milliliter, and she was treated with antibiotics. At month four, after enrollment, she did have a relapse, and that's this asterisk right there. Her, pres her relapse was scalp tenderness, weight loss, and elevation in ESR, as you can tell from the rise in ESR right here. And so her prednisone was promptly increased um, from 10 milligrams to 20 milligrams. And because her Burkholderia lipopolysaccharide titer never really dropped, um, if you remember, the other patient dropped a lot lower. It never really dropped. Um, because of that, Dr. Curry, her rheumatologist, actually um, gave her another course of minocycline um, just to see if it could come down. Um, and it did, and it seemed to also match her ESR uh, level. So the next case is a 61-year-old woman, um, again, pres presenting um, with a giant cell arteritis relapse, and her presentation was actually painful in cold hands when driving, and she was found to have bilateral subclavian occlusions, and because of that, she needed a right upper extremity bypass, and her carotid and brachial artery biopsies were sent to pathology, and it showed up um, with giant cells. Um, and so her, before enrollment, her Burkle dairy titer was also elevated at 513. She was put on minocycline, and she's been followed for about 10 months, and in that time, she did have a relapse that included jaw pain, and because of that, her prednisone was increased. Um, the interesting thing about her story is that, number one, she never really had elevated ESR um, throughout the time that she's been followed um, or at presentation, and um, she all kind of constantly had left upper extremity pain with exertion. Um, and it was, so it's kind of hard to tell if she was, you know, having smoldering disease. Um, and so here with this ESR in red, it just kind of reflects, so it's about 20. Um, you just have to take off one zero. But um, so the ESR has been about 20 to 8 to 10 the whole time. Um, and despite her relapse right here, 
um, the ESR kind of stayed the same all the way through. Um, however, the Burkle dairy lipopolysaccharide titer has always been high. So it started out at 500, it didn't drop too low, dropped about 300. And then you wonder if this number right here before the relapse um, was trying to hint at potentially her potential to relapse, um, but it's hard to say. Um, and so case four is an 80-year-old man um, whose presentation was anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. And he was followed by Dr. Warner for about nine months where there was uh, multiple attempts made to bring his steroid dose below 20 milligrams. I think there were like three trials to get him below 20 milligrams and every time he would have recurrence of vision symptoms. Um, <coughs> and he unfortunately also had severe osteoporosis with compression fractures from the steroids and a bout of pneumonia which could have been from being on the steroids as well. Um, so nine months after multiple attempts to get her, him below 20 milligrams for prednisone, he was enrolled in the study. Um, and he was enrolled because his titer was elevated at 590. Um, and he was put on minocycline. And in about, ten, in about seven months, he actually finally went below 10 milligrams um, for his prednisone. And at 17 months follow-up, he has not had another relapse. Um, his prednisone dose is currently at 1.5, and he might be on that for a long time. Um, and this is his graph of his ESR in red. Um, and you can tell that his ESR also wasn't all that elevated for his age. So 32 was his presentation ESR, and his ESR kind of oscillates in different areas, um, but kind of within the normal range. Um, but his lipopolysaccharide titer drops and then stays low and is more reflective of his remission status than potentially the ESR. Um, and this last case is from the VA. Uh, he is an 87-year-old man with a new diagnosis of giant cell arteritis and he had sequential uh, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy and here's that pallid swelling. Uh, he had a very elevated ESR with 74 and he had a positive temporal artery biopsy. And it sounds like within a week, he had both eyes affected. Um, his case was a little different because he got some heparin um, because he had um, such a severe course of the giant cell arteritis, um, but eventually he was placed on steroids. And again, his Burkle dairy titer was elevated, and so he was treated with 30 days of minocycline, and at eight months follow-up, he did have a relapse while he was on a little dose of prednisone at one milligram and his relapse was jaw pain and headache. Um, and, and his steroids were promptly increased to 20, and once they increased that, he had hallucinations and agitation and delirium while at his skilled nursing facility. And then this is his graph, this is his treatment with minocycline, and you can tell that both the lipopolysaccharide titer and the ESR rise right at the point of his relapse. Uh, so this graph shows basically the peak Burkle dairy titer for each case and the, the, the trough Burkle dairy titer. And in this graph, you can kind of tell which ones had relapse. And so it was case two, case three, and case five that had relapse. And the two that did not have relapse were case four and case one. And they seem to have the steepest slope of drop in this Burkle dairy titer. Um, and then also if you look at the cases that had relapse, um, the one that the person who relapsed the fastest was the one who had the least drop in the Burkle dairy titer. So we'll probably need more numbers to kind of sort that out. Um, but the overall conclusions in this pilot study is that there have been so far six patients enrolled, um, and I guess five of them have completed the antibiotics. Um, and out of those three have had flares. Um, and so you might think that this is quite a lot of flares. I mean, it might be, but um, when you look closer into how they were treated, they were actually treated with a really fast steroid taper. Um, and most of them were tapered on a plan that was 210 days to be off steroids. And that's quite a lot. And when you look at rheumatologists, they kind of drag things out sometimes to one to two years. Um, so this was a very fast taper, and that's probably why we got some of this signal. Um, and it seems like the ones that had flares had the smallest drop in the lipopolysaccharide titer after antibiotics. And none of these flares in these three people 
uh, resulted in a serious complication, and none of them had um, new ophthalmologic involvement. And none of them had any side effects to this antibiotic minocycline or doxycycline. Um, three of them did have steroid side effects, like the adaster necrosis, delirium, and then the compression fractures. And then it seemed like even though the titers dropped, they still stayed elevated after treatment. They never went down to normal, a normal controls level, which is about under 100 or 50 picograms per milliliter. Um, so in conclusion, uh, it seemed like adjuvant antibiotic therapy in patients with giant cell arteritis is safe. Um, perhaps this Burkholderi lipopolysaccharide titer could be a novel marker for monitoring disease. And then many patients with giant cell arteritis suffer from complications, severe complications from long-term steroid treatment um, between 58 to 86 percent. And uh, perhaps therapy directed at Burkholderia, the, the strain of Burkholderia, may help some people uh, taper off of steroids. And in order to answer that question, um, we definitely need a future study. And the goal is to have a prospective placebo-controlled multicenter trial of patients with steroids and antibiotics versus patients with steroids and placebo. Um, and that's it. So I definitely want to thank Dr. Katz and Dr. Uh, Kennig for involving me in their research, and then Dr. Warner and Dr. Figri for helping me, me with everything. And then I don't think we've met Ivana. I kind of wanted her to talk today, but I don't think we had enough time. Um, but you can invite her some other time to talk about her research. Um, so, not yet, um, but their steroid, their titers are high, um, <laughs> but I think some of that is, still needs to be analyzed. Um, And some of them, I don't think I went into it in too much detail, but Dr. Kennedy, the rheumatologist, had extended their minocycline um, for 60 days. Um, so I don't really have the results of that, but he's starting to do that. When I was looking through some of the controls, which were kind of really hard to analyze, um, they because they were treated by outside rheumatologists, um, a lot of them were on methotrexate um, and Imuran, um, and so that has to be accounted for, I'm sure, in the future study. Um, oh, I don't know that answer. 
answer. <laughs> Yeah, just I think just reviewing the charts. None of the rheumatologists here use the neuron and lipopeptate, but then because we have some of the controls that are treated elsewhere, those have been. But I can't tell you if, if they're doing worse or better. much more common than Tom's disease. <laughs> <laughs> 